just a flesh wound. It's a Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Soft Tissue OT podcast. My name is Jordan, the Soft Tissue OT. In today's podcast, we're talking about SIJ pain and dysfunction. I wanted to dive into this topic because I feel like it's a condition that is very poorly managed, incorrectly diagnosed, and incorrectly treated. And it's one that's actually quite simple if you understand a little bit more about the biomechanics, how the injuries uh, to this joint occur, and specifically what you can do to rehab it. So although this joint plays a critical role in stability and movement, it's very misunderstood um, and misdiagnosed and often mistreated. So we're diving today into SIJ pain and dysfunction. And we'll explore firstly the anatomy of the SIJ. So you get a better picture of what we're talking about, how it becomes injured, and most importantly, the key considerations that you need to know to rehabilitate it effectively. So if you're dealing with persistent SIJ pain, then this episode will help you to understand exactly what's going on and how to take control of your recovery. So let's get started. So let's dive into the anatomy of the sacroiliac joint. To understand the SIJ dysfunction, we need to start with this anatomy. Now the sacroiliac joint sits at the base of your spine where the sacrum, the triangle bone at the bottom of your spine meets the ilium, which is your um, part of your pelvis. So you have two SI joints one on either side of the of the body or one on either side of the pelvis. And their primary function is load transfer between the spine and the lower body. So the key features of the SIJ, what makes it so unique is that it's a very, very stable joint reinforced by a lot of strong ligaments and also surrounded by major muscle groups, including the glutes, lats, and core stabilizer muscles. And unlike other synovial joints, it has very limited mobility. Only a few degrees of movement, which is essential because, as mentioned, its primary role is force absorption and stability. Now, the SIJ, as we mentioned before, has a lot of ligaments, but it's also very dependent on muscular support, meaning that instability or weakness in surrounding muscles can lead to excessive movement and therefore can lead to pain and issues of the SIJ. Now, how did the SIJ become injured and how does dysfunction develop? Well, research has shown that SIJ dysfunction typically arises due to instability rather than stiffness. And this is a key thing that a lot of people must understand. Unlike the lumbar spine, which can become overly stiff, the SIJ often moves too much. When surrounding muscles fail to stabilize it properly, or we're putting excessive strain onto those joints more than they can handle. And to clarify, I'm not talking about a significant amount of movement. It's hardly something that people will be able to observe with the naked eye. And to be clear, I'm not saying your hips are out or your SIJ is out or whatever other nonsense that unethical clinicians falsely claim so that they can manipulate your joint back into place. That's not what I'm talking about at all. Um, what I am saying is that it's a joint that is meant to be super stable and becomes less stable. And again, back to its job, because it needs to bear that load and bear that weight, when it becomes unstable or when we lose some stability, that's when issues can occur. So common issues of SIJ dysfunction include unilateral loading. So movements that in place uneven stress on one side of the pelvis, such like lunges, single leg exercises, or prolonged asymmetrical postures. And I'm going to try and do this as best to describe it for those just listening without the visual representation of the YouTube video. And if you're not checking it out on YouTube, make sure you go and do that as well, because we can give you better insight into the visuals. But when we're doing unilateral work, so say the lunge, for example, if I come side on from here, if we're taking the lunge, when your one leg goes forward, your SIJ on that side gets tilted slightly backwards or goes under uh, posterior tilting force, right? Then your back leg, which is behind you, it does the opposite. That SIJ is actually being pulled forward into an anterior pelvic tilt. And so that sheer forcing when one's moving across the other, that can be very provocative for uh, SIJ and can lead to a lot of um, issues because we're creating that tension and torsioning and creating less stability at that joint. So that's the first one. Secondly, linked into that is glute weakness, right? So the glutes are super, super important when it comes to SIJ stability and obviously the lower spine stability as a whole. But when they are weak or not doing their job properly, they can fail to control the forces that pass through the joints or pass through the SIJ 
and that can lead to irritation and pain of the joint. And this goes back to a little bit about what we spoke in one of our previous podcasts about um, the neutral zone hypothesis in three parts. Remember the passive, active, and neuromuscular. Um, and we're talking about the active system being the muscles in this case, not doing their job. So that's where the passive system or the joint and the ligaments become overloaded. Um, go check out that other previous podcast if you're unsure what we've spoken about, because it will give you a great framework for a lot of musculoskeletal issues. Um, continuing on that vein of muscular weakness, latissimus dorsi dysfunction. So the lats create a very important force coupling system with the glutes, helping to reinforce SIJ stability. So if we've got poor lat engagement or activation, this can reduce the buttressing effect that those muscles have to stabilize that joint, and they reduce the support of the SIJ joint. Okay. And then we're last looking at something like trauma, repetitive stress. So you can think of falls, direct impacts, or repetitive motions that we spoke about, particularly with unilateral, they can overload and overstress and eventually lead to disrupted SIJ mechanics. Now, what I wanna do is spend a little bit of time speaking about SIJ pain in pregnancy because it's very, very common. And um, I wanna talk about why. So pregnant women are particularly prone to SIJ pain or dysfunctions due to a couple of things. Number one, hormonal changes, right? As you know, there's a lot of changes that occur during pregnancy, the biomechanical changes and the postural changes that occur during pregnancy. So first we talk about the hormonal effects. There's a whole bunch of amazing chemicals and hormones that are released during pregnancy to obviously help the baby develop, but also help the mother get ready for birth, right? So one of them is relaxin, uh, the hormone relaxin, and that increases joint laxity in preparation for childbirth, right? Now, if we think about where the child's meant to birth through. It's coming through, obviously, the uterus um, and the, the pelvis itself. So your pelvis, which is formed by the SIJ forming together with the iliac, as we spoke about, or ilium, the ligaments that are around there are actually getting softer when this hormone is released and they're becoming more supple. So they're becoming more stretchy so that they can actually uh, stretch out a bit more to allow the pelvis to open up and then, obviously, the, the baby to pass through, right? So with that increased laxity comes increased instability of that joint. That's why it make, makes a big change on it. Next, we have increased load in the pelvis, right? As the baby grows, the pelvis must support additional weight, and this can alter the force distributions across the lower back and also obviously the SIJ and the lumbar spine. And then finally, the change in the posture of the positions, right? And again, remember posture just means a migration of stress. So as you can imagine, when you are pregnant, you're carrying more weight in front of you what's going to happen is you're going to have to lean back to counteract that force, right? Otherwise you would fall forward naturally. So you have this gentle little arch backwards that we start to see. And that's where um, you can see a lot of uh, ladies who are pregnant have a little bit more of that exaggerated lumbar um, curve, the lumbar lordosis. And that extra little bit of weight plus that extra bit of tilting and the change in the postural position means that we're putting more stress through that sacrum and through the SIJ. And unfortunately, as the more weight we're taking, we need more stability. But with those other hormones being released, as we're saying, it's actually adding less stability. So it's almost a bit of a catch-22 scenario when it comes to it. And then lastly, as the belly expands, you know, core muscles change, the deep core muscles and glutes become a little bit harder to engage. Um, uh, you know, your diastasis recti when your um, abdominal muscles sort of pull apart and those abdominal muscles attach attach via the fascia and then form around to form almost as like a waistband for the lumbar spine. And so as you are reducing the strength of those muscles, you're going to reduce the support of the SIJ. So that's why SIJ pain is so prevalent during pregnancy and postpartum. And the key, again, addressing stability in the muscular support, because obviously we need the hormones to do their part, but if you can change the one thing, it's the muscular support and activation. And that's why that is key for managing the symptoms of renting long-term dysfunction. Okay, moving swiftly on to how to rehab the SIJ dysfunction. So as we spoke about, the key with this one is building stability, right? If the, the problem is instability, the mechanical antidote is stability. Makes sense, right? So what we're doing here is building stability rather than increasing mobility when it comes to SIJ pain. The goal is to stiffen that joint so it can bear more load and bear load effectively, right? So rather than relying solely or, or um, putting excess strain on those passive structures like the ligaments, what we want to do is use that active system to help stabilize. So the key rehab strategies, once you have identified that this is actually the issue that's causing your pain dysfunction, because again, it can often be misdiagnosed, what we want to start off with in terms of the rehab is firstly, spinal hygiene and developing movement proficiency, right? So 
What we're talking about is developing quality movement patterns that assist with desensitizing the sensitized tissue. And this helps to build a foundation for pain-free movement. Um, and if you think about the more efficient we move through joints, the less excessive stress, if I can term it that way, that we put through those joints. Uh, we're using the right muscles in the right way at the right time. The efficient is the movement is more efficient and the better that our movements are going to be and therefore less likely to cause excessive stress on those joints. So that's the first key. Next within that is lumbar pelvic control, right? So we're talking about the lumbar spine and then the pelvis and the relation between those two. You've got to build your, your control of that and learn how to move and where you are in, in different positions, right? Um, and then we also want to build on hip-centric rotation, which is something we always talk about. Your hips are the largest joints in the body and the most powerful joints. So that's why I want the movement to come through there. And then lastly, we're thinking about posterior connect chain powered movements, right? So engaging the posterior chain all together, and they'll help to link in all those muscles that create better movement patterns, but also create stability where it's required. Building on that, we like to then focus a little bit more on stability uh, through stability specific exercises. So McGill Big 3, which we've done a podcast on before. Um, so if you want to take a deep dive into that, go check out our previous podcast, but that'll be a great way to start. The Modified Curl Up Side Plank and Bird Dog, which are the, the McGill Big 3. We also like to, to work in some bracing techniques and bracing the core correctly, not drawing your belly button in, none of that TA nonsense. Um, bracing the core correctly can help to stabilize the lumbar spine and build a better foundation to, to tolerate load. Then what we also want to think about is avoiding excessive of unilateral movements. As we spoke about before, when you are engaging in movements that create asymmetrical loading, so loading of the one side or the one SIJ unevenly compared to the other side, such as deep lunges, single leg squats, or um, prolonged standing on one leg, that's going to create a lot of uh, torsional stress on that SIJ and then opposing SIJ. So instead, we're going to focus on bilateral movements. And this is where um, we can start to integrate things like hip bridges or glute bridges using bilateral instead of single leg. Squats, great one because they're moving in the same direction. Deadlifts, again, can be a good one because your SIJ are moving in the same direction. And that's what I often tell patients just as a quick side note is think about whatever movement you're doing. You want both your SIJs to move in the same direction. So again, split lunge, they're moving in opposing directions. So we don't do that. But like a squat, they're going in the same direction. And that just helps to evenly distribute the force across the pelvis. And building on that, one key part that often isn't spoken about, and it's so relevant, and this is where you can really make a big difference when it comes to SIJ, is the force coupling system that you create when you activate the lats and the glutes together. So the lats create a force coupling system with the glutes, and that helps to reinforce SIJ stability. The force coupling system between the glutes and the lats plays a crucial role in helping to stabilize the lumbar spine and the SIJ, and the system relies also on the lumbodorsal fascia, also called the thoracolumbar fascia. It's a key connective uh, tissue structure that integrates the movement and function of these muscles and sort of links them together. So we'll break this down a little bit more in detail so you can understand what we're talking about and um, understand how the system provides stability and force transmission. So firstly, talking about force transmission across the SIJ when we're talking about that coupling of the lats and the glutes. When the right glute contracts, it's going to pull on the ilium, which is again that pelvic bone, stabilizing it. Simultaneously, if you're getting the left lat to contract, so we've got the, the right glute and the left lat, that creates a counter force that stabilizes the joint right? Because it's it's coming through almost like a cross sling, as we like to call it, of the fascia. Um, so the, the right lower side, the left upper side, and it's creating that, that crossover. Now, this cross body force tension compresses the SIJ joint, the SI joint, and that reinforces the stability and prevents from excessive movement. So it's, it's literally, as the name suggests, force coupling, it's like helping to buttress it together, and that creates the stability. So Another effect from that is enhancing spinal stiffness. The lats and glutes tension the, again, thoracolumbar fascia, which in turn stabilizes the lumbar spine. Now, this is particularly beneficial for those with low back issues or SIJ dysfunction when excessive motion can cause that instability in the problem, right? And this is, again, where we use that whole posterior chain to work together, but particularly those two muscles which help to stabilize the, the, the lower lumbar spine and the SIJ. It also helps to improve load transfer and functional movements. So when you lift, run, or perform you know, rotational movements, the lats and glutes coordinate to dissipate that force efficiently across the spine and the pelvis. So it helps to distribute it, making it less provocative in one part of that uh, lower 
body, lower back and SIJ. And the force coupling mechanism specifically with SIJ reduces shear stress, right? And that prevents that, um, you know, shearing that we're talking about, which is very provocative for the SIJ. So when we're talking about SIJ, one of the key ones is really that force coupling um, action. So hopefully didn't lose you there too much, but spoke a little bit about it. And just understand that when we activate those two together, so again, left, lat, right, glute, they come and stabilize SIJ, right, lat, left, glute is coming over and we're we creating all this, that X, that cross um, fascial sling that we talk about. So some exercises that can help to strengthen glutes and lats, well, it obviously depends on the individual where they are, but one of the ones we like to start with um, is the lock clams. So again, if we think about the stability of um, those muscles and we want to work the glutes, we want to limit the involvement of the opposing muscles, which are hip flexors, and that's where that lock clam can come in so well. Then building on that, we like to do glute bridges. Again, double legs, not single legs. Um, you can chuck a band on there as well to add extra force and external rotation force that it's got to work against. And we also like to work the lateral trunk and the glutes together. So again, the side plank we spoke about, the McGill Big Three, that's a great one because it's linking your lateral side, your lateral core, and your glute together, right? Further creating more stability at that joint. Then another more advanced one we like to do is um, farmer carries. So we're training that brace and we use the opposing arms. So if you're carrying on one side, the other side, we're really emphasizing the lat brace to come into it. And then that glute that's uh, working in the load bearing, that helps create that force coupling mechanism. And then the banded hip abduction with lat row, right? So we loop a band around your knees. Um, we've made a video about this before on our socials, so go and check that out. And then you can either do single arm or double arm rows like a lat row. And when we sort of in a half squatted position, pushing the knees out, and then we're rowing, we're pulling that one arm, that's where that lat and those glutes are really activating and creating supreme stiffness at that joint, which is a great one for that full body coordination as well. Okay, so final thoughts. If you're struggling with ASIJ dysfunction or pain, it's essential to address the underlying cause rather than just treating the symptom, right? And that's why I said before when you started, it is often so incorrectly treated because everyone's about mobility and more mobility this, more mobility that. That's exactly the opposite of what the SIJ needs, right? So the key is a strategic approach to stability and strength. And that's the key to lasting relief when it comes to these issues. So understand that the majority of SIJ issues stem from reduced ability, which can occur from a variety of reasons that we mentioned above. But due to this, the key is the stability and stability the right way. All right, so hopefully you understand this and please feel free to share this one to anyone who's dealing with SIJ issues. Uh, thanks for tuning in and found this uh, episode helpful or useful or insightful. Think about subscribing and sharing with somebody who might benefit. And until next time, keep learning, keep healthy and keep doing what you love.